This is Biology 160, Introduction to Anatomy and Physiology, Continued Lectures on the Respiratory System. In this part of the lecture, we're going to wrap things up talking about the things, the control mechanisms of breathing and some of the things you can, uh, some of the diseases associated with respiration, and then wrap it up talking about some of the changes that happen over our lifetime. Respiration is controlled by our nervous system, and there's two... Um, nerves that come from the brain. So these are cranial nerves that, that control respiration. And so you'll probably recognize the names here from, from earlier lectures on the nervous system. We have the, the phrenic nerve and the intercostal nerves. And the neural, the neural centers that control the rate and the depth of the breathing are found in the medulla oblongata and in the pons. And the way this is set up is the, the medulla sets the basic rhythm for breathing. It has a pacemaker, a respiratory pacemaker, that we call the, the VRG, or the uh, ventral respiratory group. And that's found in the medulla, and that's what, what sets the pace for breathing. And then the pons, its job is to basically smooth out the, the rhythm of the breathing. These can be affected eventually by drinking. So, if, so al alcohol can affect the the uh, the pacemaker, the medulla. And if someone becomes too in intoxicated, they can um, basically stop breathing as as it as it shuts down the medulla, um, and that can definitely be devastating. The normal ne respiratory rate, as said by the medulla is about 12 to 15 respirations per minute, and that's pretty average. And the, the term that goes with this is eupnea. That's the normal respiratory rate. Whenever, we start, whenever you start exercising, your rate is going to increase, and that's, that's okay. It's supposed to because your cells are going to need new oxygen, more oxygen, as they're trying to work harder and, and do the work that you're having them do. And then your respiratory rate will increase, and we call this hyperpnea. Normally, that's fine. Um, but one interesting thing is that the when we exercise, the rate of breathing may not increase, but uh, just the, the amount of oxygen we're trying to pull in may increase. And so there's a couple ways that it can happen, but breathing faster is a part of part of exercising. But your your muscles, your diaphragm, everything's going to be trying to increase the amount of volume so that you're getting more air in and out than you were before. Here's a little picture showing the the relationship between all these control mechanisms. Here you can see the nerves coming down from the brain. So the phrenic nerve and then the intercostal nerves affecting the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm to help us breathe. And then you can see the breathing control centers in the medulla and also in the pons and how they're related here. Next we're going to talk about these other controls. So these are non-neuronal, um, neur neur uh, neural factors that affect the breathing rate that we have. And so we'll, we'll focus on these next. There is an oxygen sensor and it's found in the aortic body of the aortic arch. So this is the aorta is where the blood is, is, is the blood that is leaving the heart. So the blood, as it's leaving the heart and going to the body, it should have already picked up oxygen. So if there's a low oxygen content, then this little center here works as a trigger to tell the brain that we're not getting enough oxygen in the blood. We must need to increase the, the rate of breathing. And so that, that can trigger the, the rate to increase. So oxygen is important in controlling the amount, the rate of breathing that we have, but CO2 is also important, and it's even more important in, than oxygen in causing us to breathe. In fact, when we take our first breath as a, a newborn baby, it's not the lack of oxygen that triggers us to breathe, but the increase of CO2 or the uh, decrease of the pH or the drop in pH caused by that increase of CO2 in our blood. And that's, that causes us to take our first breath. So, so it's kind of interesting. 
O2 is important, but CO2 is the major factor in causing us to breathe. So as CO2 increases in the blood, that's going to make the, the pH drop, and that's going to trigger the breathing control centers to tell our, tell our body to breathe. And the way this works here is it affects the cerebral spinal fluid. So the cerebral spinal fluid is bathing the brain. As the CO2 increases in the blood, that's going to affect the pH of the, the cerebral spinal fluid. And then that will directly affect the pons and the medulla and tell it to increase the rate of breathing. So there, there are some other things that increase the rate of breathing as well, or that, af or that affect the rate of breathing as well. So together, we would call these the chemical factors that affect the, the rate of breathing. And these are very important. CO2 is so important. These chemical factors are so important that um, they, they take over control. So we do have some voluntary control over the rate of breathing. So you can affect the rate of breathing as, as you're talking, singing, when you're coughing, swallowing, all of these things can affect your rate of breathing. And so there is voluntary control, but only to a certain extent, meaning that you can't hold your breath and kill yourself, or you can't hold your breath so long that your body runs out of oxygen and, and you die. Um, you can try this. You can hold your breath and force yourself not to breathe, but at some point, your body's going to say, well, you're not, your voluntary control, we're taking it back. Your brain's going to take over, and it's going to take over, take back the involuntary control, and it's going to make you, make you breathe. So, and if you've ever had a little brother or sister or, or a child, sometimes they'll threaten to hold their breath till they pass out. And, and they can, they can, some, some kids do have enough um, will power so that they can hold their breath so long that they pass out. But once they pass out, their body takes over uh, involuntary control and starts breathing again. So they're not going to be able to hold their breath so long that they, that they, they die. And so that's an important thing. Um, emotion can also affect our breathing as well. Um, so that's emotions, physical, physical things that are, that are happening that can cause us to um, breathe differently. And so all these things come in together to affect the breathing rate in our body. I want to point out one thing that I've, I read in the book here that I hadn't realized before. This is kind of interesting because I've said here that CO2 is the most important factor. Oxygen is the second most important factor. And that's usually true, but um, in some people that have carbon dioxide, have uh, high levels of carbon dioxide because of emphysema, chronic uh, bron bronchitis or other sorts of lung diseases, the brain will stop recognizing the, the levels of CO2 to stimulate breathing, and it will focus on oxygen instead, which is fine. But the only problem is that if they go to the doctor and they start taking oxygen supplements, start breathing oxygen, um, the doctor has to make sure that they are given low doses of oxygen because if they're given pure oxygen, then the body will say, oh, we're getting enough oxygen, and the breathing mechanism will shut off, and they could actually um, stop breathing because of that. And so that's kind of an interesting twist to this whole thing of what's going on. So here is a list of things that can affect breathing rate that are non-neural. Increased body temperature can. Exercise, of course, talking, coughing, uh, voluntary control, emotional factors as well. Breathing becomes an important part of maintaining homeostasis or maintaining the pH of the blood. So if you remember from the lecture on blood, our blood has a certain pH. It doesn't, it doesn't vary very much um, from that 7 point, about 3, 5 uh, pH. So slightly alkaline, slightly basic blood. And so if our blood starts to get too acidic, we call that acidosis, and we'll start hyperventilating. And the function here is to return our body to homeostasis. So as CO2 is increasing, we want to get rid of that CO2 to move our pH back to where it should be, restore, restore that normal pH. And the opposite would be hypoventilation. And this is when our blood becomes too basic, too alkaline. And so we breathe more slowly 
to try to build up the CO2 in our blood to, to take it back to that, that level of pH that we need in the blood. Let's take the rest of the time in this lecture to talk a little bit about respiratory disorders. One of the main ones is something called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or so you may have heard of it called COPD. There are a number of, th this encapsulates a number of different disorders, but uh, in general, this is going to be chronic bron bronchitis or something called emphysema, which you've also probably heard, often in conjunction, conjunction with smokers. And this COPD is a major cause of death and disability in the, in the U.S. So there is a lot, this, this happens quite commonly, and it causes a lot of problems. People that suffer from COPD have a number of uh, characteristics in common. So most patients have a history of smoking. So that's something that as you smoke, you're more likely to uh, experience emphysema. They also have labored breathing, and it's going to become worse and worse over time. And then they also are often coughing, and they have frequent pulmonary infections. Something about smoking, we talked about how the cilia in the respiratory tract, the trachea, and also in the, uh, the nasal area, the nasal cavity, the cilia are there with the mucus layer, and they're catching the debris, the, the microorganisms that aren't supposed to be there, and they're removing them from our respiratory system. When you smoke, one of the things that happens is the cilia... Are, are broken or they're ruined, so then they're no longer able to do their job. They're not able to remove that mucus from your uh, respiratory tract. And so we associate smoking with coughing, and the reason that they are connected is because if those cilia are gone, the only way to remo remove the mu mucus from your respiratory tract is by coughing, and that's why they develop this cough. Luckily, if you quit smoking, if it's not too severe, if it hasn't been too long, then those cilia may be able to regenerate and, and then that cough will go away. Some other features of this, uh, some other features of this disease are the vic victims are hypoxic. They retain carbon dioxide. They're not able to get rid of that carbon dioxide in their body. And so they end up with acidosis. And eventually it's going to lead to uh, respiratory failure. So chronic bron bronchitis, what causes this is this is the mucus in the lower respiratory tract becomes inflamed. And because of that, the production of mucus increases and it starts to get in the way of, of ventilation. So because of all this mucus, we're not able to get, the person's not able to get all that air they need into their lungs. And then also the gas exchange isn't able to happen because of the buildup of mucus. And on top of that, as the mucus in builds up, there's an increased re risk of lung infection. So mucus is good in that it catches bacteria, catches the, the dirt and particles and things like that. But if you can't get rid of that mucus, it becomes bad. So catching that stuff and getting rid of it is good, but mucus is a nice place for bacteria to grow. So if the bacteria are getting caught in the mucus and the mucus isn't being re removed, then the, then the bacteria can start to grow and develop and they're going to cause some sort of infection, such as pneumonia or just inflammation. Um, and so that's chronic bronchitis. And then emphysema, what's happening in emphysema is the alveoli are starting to get bigger. So instead of looking like a cluster of grapes, the alveoli walls between the alveoli are going to break down and so you end up with these larger chambers, which, in, which inhibits the gas exchange as well. So you're not having a good, as good as good gas exchange. You're also going to have inflammation. It's going to cause lung fibrosis. And then eventually the airways can, can collapse. So um, as you're breathing out, those alveoli, because they've enlarged, they're not able to stay open anymore, and suddenly they'll collapse as you expire, and that becomes a problem. And so it takes a lot of work in order to breathe, breathe out. And uh, the lungs can become overinflated. You end up with cyanosis, and they're called pink puffers. So emphysema is a very debilitating disease and very sad, but it's caused by problems with the, the respiratory tract. Another one that's very common is lung cancer. Lung cancer is also linked to smoking as well, but it's one-third of all the cancer deaths in the United States, so it's the most common type of uh, 
cancer to die from, and it's more people die from lung cancer than any other type of cancer, and even the well-known known ones like breast cancer and uh, um, the other common cancers like uh, prostate cancer. <clears throat> so more people die from lung cancer than all of those combined. So it's a very um, high incident high incident cancer that causes a lot of pro problems. There's three types. There's squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, and small cell carcinoma. And we're not going to go through all these different types. But I do want to show you this picture of the two lungs, and I believe this is from your, your book. You can see the healthy lung of a non-smoker on the left, and then the cancerous lung of a smoker who has lung cancer. I guess that was, I just kind of repeated myself. But anyway, this is a cancerous lung on the right. And you can see how much has changed uh, because, of the, because of the cancer, because of the smoking. So smoking can lead to emphysema and chronic bronchitis as the mucus and things build up, trying to get rid of the, the smoke, and it's inhibited by the smoke. And so that, that, those are disorders that can come from smoking. But the cancer comes from the chemicals in the smoking. So the, the free radicals, the nicotine, the chemicals that are inhaled with the smoke, that's what can lead to the lung cancer and is eventually going to lead to, to death. So those are some examples of respiratory problems that can happen. I want to point out a couple things about development of the respiratory system. So when we're in our mother's womb, as a fetus, we don't have any use for our lungs. So we're getting all the oxygen we need from our mother, exchanging through the placenta. We're also getting rid of the CO2. So our lungs aren't used yet, and so they're filled with fluid as a fetus. They're not being used. And that fluid isn't totally gone, or the lungs aren't totally inflated, clear until two weeks after birth. So there is this area of time where the lungs aren't being used fully. During that time, our cells in our lungs are also producing this surfactant. And we talked a little bit about surfactant before, but it's a fatty molecule. It's made by cells in the alveoli. And the function of this surfactant is surface tension. So without the surfactant, every time we breathe out, the alveoli would collapse. And that's a problem. But with the surfactant, what it does is it allows, it, it keeps the surface tension there and allows those alveoli to stay uh, open so we can continue breathing well. And it's not present until late in development, so around 28 to 30 weeks in the pregnancy, this is when surfactant starts to be produced. So premature babies aren't actively producing surfactant, but we can now give surfactant to them and this has increased the, the rate of survival of premature babies a lot. If the infant is not producing enough surfactant, it can lead to something called ERDS, or Infant Respiratory Distress Syndrome. There's also something called cystic fibrosis, which is a disorder that is re related to the respiratory system. And in cystic fibrosis, this is a genetic disorder, and it shows up in, in children. It's a genetic disorder passed on from mom and dad, where they're, they're, they have a mutation in their genetics that causes the mucus inside their respiratory tract to be very thick, and also in their digestive tract as well. So it affects a, a few different systems, but one of the main places is the respiratory system. And historically, people with cystic fibrosis would not live to adulthood because in infancy or in adolescence, because of this thick mucus, they would end up with uh, respiratory infections. And eventually, because of those infections and different things going on, their respiratory system would shut down and they'd end up dying from cystic fibrosis. Today, with breathing treatments, and um, there's also treatments where it actually vibrates their body to break up the mucus so that they can cough it up. They're able to live a lot longer than they used to be able to. And so that's some great um, strides that have been done. And there's research being done to try to fix that mutation, be able to uh, do gene therapy to help people with cystic fibrosis as well. Changes in our respiratory system over life. So when we're newborns, we breathe a lot more than when we're adults. So Newborns, 40 to 80 uh, respirations per minute. Infants, about 30. Then age 5, we're down to 25. And then by the time we reach adulthood, 12 to 18 respirations per minute. And then that, that might increase a little bit with age over time as well. 
You may have also heard of something called SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And this is where, for some, some reason, an infant will stop breathing and dies during their sleep. So mom and dad will come in in the morning and find that their, their baby has died. And it, it can't really be explained at this time. We're not really sure what causes SIDS. But there's a number of hypotheses out there. Um, s some people think it could be a problem with that. the respiratory control center that we talked about. Um, maybe due to the heart rhythm, there may be a genetic component. There's still a lot of research being done here. It's a very sad situation um, that can't be explained. So, Last of all, there's something called asthma that you've probably heard about before. And this is where... Um, the bronchial passages are, are flamed almost constantly. And so it can be triggered by a number of things, but it leads to coughing and wheezing. The person is not able to get the, the air that they need. Asthma can be very dangerous. It can lead to death. But if it's treated, it's, it's something that can be controlled as well, uh, depending on what's causing the asthma. All right, so that's some of the that's how that's what controls our respiratory system. Some of the problems that, that can happen with it, and that's where we're going to end our lecture on the respiratory system.